I spoke a few months ago um, on Zoom uh, at a meeting, and I was giving some um, some good comments. I thought they were good anyway. And as I went on, I was almost ready to wrap up. And the chair, uh, the chair, couldn't say the time. So I asked for, I asked for, if I could finish my last sentence. And then we got set up kind of a mini debate where actually be allowed to have that last sentence. And I was allowed to have the last sentence. I finished up. And that was that. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't like that. We were way, uh, process that went on and being much directed. But that was the bar. That's, that's what happened. And so I was a little bit surprised when I watched the September 6th movie. The gentleman sat down, you know, he sat down in the chair and he spoke. Um, he started speaking. We spoke for about seven and a half or eight minutes. He did not find it or whatever. It's my estimate. He was not inappropriate at all. And he should be very respectful. He was allowed to finish his comments and then invited to speak again later, which I, which I believe he did. And I'm not complaining about that. I think that's the way he should have computed. And, um, but my question is whether that's the new standard or whether it's what we need to do. Go ahead and leave it. So that's certainly the way it is. It's called the common public comment. And if someone says that, they should be treated at least generally the same way. I feel, like I said, the, the first time around, we said, we don't need to find people in the kind of habit. They should be able to let people speak. We don't have any people that have to speak at it. We should be able to let them speak, listen to them. If they speak for too long, if they simply say, but you, you wrap it up, you finish so others can speak, and then um, and, uh, let them finish up. If they, I do have a uh, a board president that had to do with the same thing. I've never had to use time. I think it's, I think you're looking at a time you're not missing it or not. So um, that's that's my thoughts on that. You know, if there are different rules, you can do whatever you can do for time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comments? Yeah. So another hand up. No, no, no. That's a let's start cursor. Cursor. Yeah. Okay. It is a hand. That's a cursor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a yellow hand though. It's it's their mouse. Okay. <laughs> All right, consent agenda. We're in AP 2410S, AP 2409IS, AP 2409S, AP 2409, AP 2409B, AP 2410, also the minutes of September 6, 2023. Uh, the DPW Wastewater Treatment Plant Operator, promotion of Ian Walcott, uh, effective September 18th, 2023. Uh, an emergency services dispatcher, uh, Stephanie Rivera, effective September 25th, 2023. So moved. Second. Motion by Joy, seconded by uh, Jane. Mm -hmm. Any? Okay. Okay. Well, if it's confined and we're doing any other motion, I'll be talking about it, right? We're good. Did you have to add anything at all? Right. No. The dispatch supervisor, uh, Mary Cahill, is on Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to hear anything about the new hire, she has some uh, information she can provide. The new hire is the first one. So, I mean, it's on a good agenda. We already said it was all good. Um, I think there's a discussion. I, I'd like to, I'm going to request that you pull that up. Uh, so, could we do that? And give Megan a chance to introduce her name. Huh? Then I'll have to pull it from the Rialto then the day. I'll make an amendment to the motion to uh, approve all except for the appointment of Stephanie Rivera until Megan 
has a chance to speak on their maybe. I'll second the amendment uh, change. Amended by Joyce, uh, seconded by Jane. Any further discussion on the items we are consenting to? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Great. And then now we can hear from Megan. Hi, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, just wanted to introduce you guys to Stephanie, unfortunately not in person, but hopefully soon. Um, Stephanie Rivera is a recent transplant to Western Mass, having grown up out east where her family was heavily involved with fire services, including having an uncle who was the fire chief of a major department. This resulted in Stephanie having a great interest in public safety and serving the public in general. In her previous work history, she has held positions that enabled her to gain a lot of experience in both customer service and administrative functions. She is greatly looking forward to starting a new career here in Hadley, and we are thrilled to welcome her to our communications team. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Stephanie. Would you like to speak at all? Stephanie, are you on? I am. Sorry about that. Oh, the volume is in and out. It's cut and dry. So we're welcoming you to Hadley. Um, hopefully you enjoyed working here. Do you have any other things that you would like to comment on in coming to Hadley? I'm just like, really excited for this opportunity. Um, like Megan said, I have a bunch of family in the fire and police force in Wareham, Mass. Um, I love working with the public and I'm just really excited to start this opportunity. Great, thank you for being on. Second day. Motion to accept um, Stephanie Rivera as the emergency service dispatcher. Second. second. <laughs> All right, motion by Joy, seconded by Molly. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Well done. Thank you. All right, moving on to old business. Hadley Levy Engineering Assessment Update. Um, Rich Niles is here from Woodward and Current to provide an update. With us, yeah, I want to go up to the front. Yeah. Hi. Miss Miss Larkin. Yeah, that's for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so while we come up, uh, this is Joe Kirby with Water and Current. Good to see yeah. you, Commander. Just our questions, ask him, please. <laughs> so I'll go through the presentation hopefully in about 15 minutes. <clears throat> so it'll be somewhat bad based, but I think so remembers the, the work we're doing. This is an update, but I think for all that we want to add in some context, uh, so we have a quickly conditions on both of us. Overview. Yeah. So we'll talk about current conditions, uh, talk about the theme of regulatory updates, remapping process very briefly, uh, talk about future planning conditions, and then uh, talk about really kind of core of the product, which has been looking at uh, the existing levy upgrades to that levy and additional funding. <laughs> Potential new levy extension to the system uh, to provide more protection, and we'll hit upon the recommendations next step. Can okay. we hold the uh, questions until the end so that you can go through your whole presentation? Yeah, I think some things will be answered as we go, and if it's a little heavy, technically, we'll revisit things and go back every session. Thank you. Um, so, this is just showing the uh, current map. Area uh, as you know, massive for flood protection. The yellow line, the purple lines for the existing levee and the lower top rail trail, which acts as a levee. The sort of uh, brownish color in the middle is what's protected. And then the area outside of that is what is designated as a 100 year floodplain. So this is based upon 1978 mapping. Uh, FEMA's been remapping this. Uh, we had new information, we have FEMA's model. That was part of what took a little bit longer with this project. We're going to wait and get model for FEMA. Then we can use the best available data to do our analysis um, and also look at future 
flows of the river due to climate change. Um, so what we think about what we call base flood elevation, uh, it's, we think it's helpful to understand that a base flood elevation is projected level of water based upon flow of the river that corresponds to a statistical value, right? Those are changing as your data is available, as climate changes. <clears throat> so we're gonna use this number 180,000 cubic feet per second as a value that represents the base flood elevation associated with this mapping uh, as it was as it shown here. Um, so 180,000 cubic feet per second is a lot of water. It's basically like the size of a ba basketball going down the river, 180,000 every second will go past here. So it's, it's a lot, of, it's a big river. We all, you know, yes, no, that's. Um, so next, please. Uh, so, the, so the heavy flood protection system, as we call it, as engineers, we call it the levee, you guys call it the dike. It's the rail trail. It has an elevation that holds back water. Right? And so this was constructed uh, following the floods back in 36 and 38. We don't have a lot of great design um, uh, plans and, and don't have a lot of information. We've done assessments over, over the years, which have developed our understanding of what it is now. This is just a funny sketch that we found in, from 1976 and repair. Uh, this is how things were done back then. And they were funny faster and more efficient than possible. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so there's there's some historical context of the levy system. Let me go to the next slide. Um, a little bit uh, dark on the left, but that's the what we call the riverbank levy. And so people are very familiar with that, walk along the top of that to be able to walk through. And then we have what we call the kind of cross country or cross path uh, level. So it's along the cross path road on the right. And so we have two different berms. And this is the existing levee that um, when we went through these previous studies, you know, we assessed those berms, earthen berms, to see how they're constructed. Next slide, please. So when we did, <coughs> me, when we did these past assessments, um, what was identified was what we call three board deficiency. And so some deficiencies, deficiencies sound bad, but it just means it's not quite tall enough for the design uh, criteria that we're trying to meet. And so there's some seepage and stability issues where you know it's really the burn is too steep and too narrow. So it has some conditions, under some conditions, it could um, become unstable. And so for the most part, it's relatively stable for most conditions. Um, again, it was built, you know, 100 years ago or you know, so, um, you know, it does meet certain design criteria, it's not all, but freeboard is, is if it's not tall enough, then it can be overclocked. So that's obviously, it's a pretty obvious risk. Other things are erosion and, and vegetative cover is not adequate. There's approaches, um, we've got animal burrows, and, and some of those are kind of routine maintenance, but things that I always want to reiterate that the levy requires a level of maintenance that, uh, to maintain what you have because it does provide protection. It does meet certain design criteria. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so under under sort of current conditions, uh, you know what we're what we've always suggested all along is keep what you have, maintain what you have. Um, but it, it does require an increased level of maintenance. We did develop just recently an operations maintenance manual, um, and so that's a, just a guideline that applies to things that you're already doing to some extent, but also includes things like criteria for flood warning. So we say at this level of river flow, based upon age data upstream, <clears throat> start paying attention. And this is kind of the threshold which you want to do some action. So it's kind of a, a bit of an emergency action plan as well. Um, and again, it's, it's really uh, the fire chief is well aware of how to manage these activities. Um, but this is kind of like a basic thing. Every lemon system should have an appointment. One so of the first things the farming board and other task force is where's your aim? Where is the save you're doing what you're doing? And at the right frequency. And, According to all those best practices in the industry. So that's a good thing. So that's kind of something that we've been reaching out. Um, next, please. So when we, when we get to flood risk, uh, I really just wanted to kind of build upon that 180,000 um, before. That's base flood elevation. But this is showing historic floods on the left. So you can see 1936 um, was the highest. And this was sort of unregulated flow before dams on the river, uh, but it was an extraordinary flow. Also, extraordinary damage from those flood events on top of the destruction of levees across along the Connecticut River Valley. And so, um, when we think of floods of record, that 180 is, is really, there's only three that come close to. So, but so but lesser floods can still be damaged. So, even if the levee doesn't meet the full criteria that corresponds to that 180,000 flow, 
Um, you know, we provide protection for lower folks, which do result in flooding. And you guys know that. You know, the recent uh, July events, um, or weather events, the river flow will peak at about 100,000 cubic feet. We saw flooding. So you start to think of these historic events and how that really impacts the community. And so you do have impact at those levels. So there's, there's reason to be flood protection or exposed. Yes, yes. Um, so, and then this is, this is all based upon real data. So there's a, a gauge in modern city, USGS, US, uh, geological survey, um, river gauge that's been collecting data from the ships. It's a hundred years worth of data that shows us how the river responds. Uh, and we, we continue to mock with uh, Mexico. So um, here's just some examples of maintenance activities that uh, DPW has, has been able to increase the level of uh, maintenance um, due to some of the increase in funding. Um, and so, but it, you know, you may have seen it requires some specialized equipment. It, it is a challenging bank to maintain. In the past, they did the best of mower you could reach and, and with uh, a small reach mower. And so uh, recently the town brought in, you know, uh, an excavator um, that sits up on top and can reach down 60 or 70 feet. Cost more money. Now, I'll move it on to be that one once a year. <laughs> but, um, but he, so you can see on the left was kind of a couple of years ago, maintenance. They've not reached down so far. And then on the right, you see a photo of a similar area of the levee where they were to reach further. You really maintain that moving vegetation. A lot of that's so that we can expect the embankments easier. And, and we don't have, it doesn't have to be perfectly manicured. But large trees and things like that are undesirable. And we want to be able to see it to detect any erosion or sediments or cracking, things like that. So that's one of the, one of the primary reasons. Um, there was a, uh, uh, there's a catch basin in a, in a pipe that goes through the levee at the end of West Street, at the court turns. You start to look at, at the end straight the levee, catch basin, <clears throat> which goes through the pipe that's the, sort of the bottom of the levee. And that um, valve is not operable. So when the water backs up, put back up into the street, it's high. You know, we did replace that valve. I think they found a valve that was the right size and did it at almost no cost. It's, it's uh, that was nice. Uh, so they did that. And so one of you areas you had a brain goes through the levee, which good. You know, until he goes to manage. Um, so that's kind of the current conditions. Um, we move to the next slide. Uh, um, so the so the FEMA regulatory context, the remapping process has been ongoing. Um, and so we've had some meetings in the past. I think people are fairly familiar with that. Uh, we'll talk about what that means next. Uh, so again, so this is just basic context. You know, the mapping started in 2018. It takes time before those are published and you know, effective, as we call them. <clears throat> so where it may become the basis of, of regulating floodplain, as well as insurance completions and such, uh, and other various other programs. Uh, next, please. And so, um, what that meant though, just is they're not remapping the process, they're using new data, they have a new model that they, that they simulate river flow and similar floodplain elevations. And so, what we see it, as a result of that river changes, uh, other structures along the river, like the Holyoke Dam and such, it changes the water surface profile, the elevations. And so, it's not that the flow is so much higher because right now they're he was modeling the flow of 100 feet, 2000, is slightly above what it was before, but the resulting change in elevation is two, three feet higher because of the development of the river and the structures that impact that, that elevation. So that the water squeezes through things and make it all that happen, right? And so you see this water surface elevation change in, in the black number um, is the original 1978 elevation. So those are in feet, those are 27 feet in general. 1.5, 1.7. And then the blue is what we evaluated um, several years ago. When we did some updated model at that time, we didn't have a new model, so we did the best of data and tried to estimate that. And then the newest FEMA ones, um, Compass is their contractor, so Compass is actually FEMA. Um, it's really like the first bullet, where it max. Um, so the <clears throat> agreement is what they're modeling now, that's the change. So you see that two foot or three foot difference in some areas. Um, so the water is, is at that point is, is a little bit higher um, based on current model, the current, current estimates. Um, so what that does, that changes, obviously it changes the limit of plumbing, 
the change in the elevation against the berm. Um, I ran that. I didn't even look. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, we, so we, we incorporated into our analysis and said, okay, well, we, we actually didn't have a very clear scope originally for the future conditions, but this data became available. The model became available. And so we were able to see it. We were doing similar work at the same time at Hatfield. So we kind of combined efforts and we said, well, we should really look at future conditions because we're going to suggest increasing the height of the levee to meet current standards. Well, what about future? Because these things are built for seven, five, and hundred years. And, and we want to look at what that might look like in the future. Um, so, so we use this data and information. The study was done by, uh, commissioned by Mass UT, done by UMass Yankers. And they looked at um, climate modeling. It's, it's very complex. We can talk all night about that and put you to sleep. But what it means is we're look, they're looking at future scenarios like precipitation trends in the region. And then they anticipate what those will be in the future. And that's a range. So we took kind of the medium or middle of that. It said it's about 15 So 15% increase in flow in the future in about 100 years. So 20, 21. <coughs> so, so this is looking at um, future conditions in, in 2100. Uh, so we have a, a flow that increases from 182,000 to 209,000. That would be that future flow in the year coming up. Again, these are all estimates with lots of variables and assumptions, but you know, it gives you some sense of magnitude change. Um, so what that means is, is that the river flow increases so naturally the elevation of flooding would increase. And so it would overtop the levee. And so we can see on that, oh, sorry. I'm looking at my screen and realizing that I didn't ask you to advance it. Next, yeah. next one, next one again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, look at this one. Uh, this is easier for me to read. <laughs> um, so there's that 209,000 on the right. You see a map that shows lots of colors. And so as you go from red to purple, it gets deeper. So the river is deep, right? So called purple. It's depth of water. Okay, about the surface beneath it. So when you see red, it's fairly shallow with high points. Uh, and then when you see no color, that's that's high ground that's out of the flow. So but what you see is that there's an area in the middle that's kind of triangular shape. That's that's the area that's still high ground, but has been over top, so everything around its flow. So that's what that looks like in that previous scenario. And now what's important though is that even though that's incorporating more land area. The depth of flooding is the difference, right? So we need to look at the depth. Is it a foot or two feet? Because in areas that are pretty flat, what makes a big difference is it spreads out, right? It'll flood the whole area, but it's only an increase in flood. Yeah. So we're looking at, um, you know, we, we focus on what those depths are, but then that's how we design things too. Like we, we're designing for a depth of flooding, an ultimate elevation. Um, so we go to the next slide. This is just a, a really quick comparison. You know, on the left is current conditions, on the right would be future. So even under current conditions, because, <laughs> because the levy doesn't have the height for the current, you know, new, new model conditions, um, there is still that play, and then it's it's more so there in the future. Um, so the depth increases, the extent increases slightly. But for the most part, most of the flooding ends about that street. Yeah, because that middle school change notes here does start to decrease enough that, that it, um, it's no longer important. Um, so, so what we looked at was um, what's the next slide? Um, so we said, okay, well, if we want to maintain the same level of protection that we had according to the 1978 maps based on this new information and data, and the fact that it has some issues of stability and other things that don't meet the highest criteria, um, what would it take to repair it? And, and what's the cost? So, so that's estimated roughly around magnitude of about twenty five million dollars. We know it's not cheap to repair levees. Um, you guys had a repair in the past, you know, about probably a decade ago, um, or more. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not cheap. And that was a small segment. We're talking about repairing and, and, and restoring and rebuilding to some extent all the main things on the river, stabilizing them, uh, across the path. Levy and then basically rebuilding the entire building, which we know would be very challenging, which is why this is possible. And so, what this does is it maintains your current level of protection, but same number of area, same area, same number of properties, etc. Um, so, you're basically making it four feet tall. 
So we're saying, you know, make it more recall. It only needs to be really a couple right now, but make it a couple more for future conditions because it doesn't cost that much more than higher, but you're touching it all together. So it's the most awesome. So that's that's sort of that option. Um, and so okay, we'll, we'll talk, these are big numbers, but we'll talk about this next week at the end in terms of funding strategies and ideas around how you advance projects like this. Um, so it's not so daunting. Uh, so then, so then we looked at uh, an alternative and said, okay, well, maybe we don't improve the rail trail and we take that level of investment and shift her along Bay Road and we start to let that actually protects the rest of the that. This is a concept that was floated um, several years ago. Went to the town meeting, which funded this project. We look at this and see, is this in the realm of possibility? And what's the rough order magnitude? What's the potential benefit of doing this? And, and so we're getting closer to numbers that start to make sense, we think. Uh, but this is again a planning level effort. But what we're, what, what we're estimating work for magnitude is, is 65 million. So that's increasing, uh, I'm sorry, upgrading the river levy, the cross path levy, and constructing a new levy along Old Bay Road. And not the rail trail. And just ignoring the rail trail. Just keep it the way it is, basically. So you have a crossing of the rail trail, you have other roads crossing, you have to have a crossing at Route 9, you have to have a pump station. Because it's a spring segment that you have to cross. <clears throat> so there's things that need to be done. We need to address drainage issues. Um, this, um, the one along Bay Road, we looked at that originally and said, okay, well, why don't we just put it along the road? It's, then we got to do behind properties and it's it's height. We're doing walls instead of earth berms, which are a little more expensive. Um, then we're not taking as much land. This results in about um, 3,000 feet of new levy. Um, so that's, that's substantial. Um, and then you can see the uh, the alignment of that is that that blue line, not the teal below it. It's the blue line above. Um, yep. So that's that option. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this is looking at just an alternative route with the same relative same level of protection. This would be going through the fields down below, where we would be doing earthen burn. We wouldn't be approaching the properties as much, but then we're putting our river through a farmer's field. Well, that's not the most desirable either. It would take a fair amount of land. Uh, earth burns are relatively wide. It would have to be really tall because, as you guys know, when you drive down there, um, you drop an elevation, so we have to have a taller burn to reach the same height that we would along Old Bay Road. So it's it's um probably a little bit easier to construct, and you know, depending on earth. Of material costs, etc., but it does make up more space. You still need a pump station. So it, it's about the same cost as what we saw. And so it's a matter of what the community would prefer, what the landowners would prefer. Yeah. And so we don't have that information now, but look at that because it seems like, well, let's, let's see if that's, let's see what that shakes out. We thought like, maybe it's cheaper, <laughs> uh, but it's not. It, it's just because it has to be there. And, and we do assume some acquisition of property costs. That we're going to have to take these things to take property. So it's possible to do that. And this is a great part, right? So uh, if you go to the next, yeah. So this is just an aerial head of drone, line and levy, line this area of Bay Road. So we can some images and just start to conceptually look at this from, from a bird's eye view. And so you see on the left the uh, area that's within the floodplain now. So those, those Properties are not protected against flooding. <clears throat> now, some of those buildings, like the hotel, have been elevated, so we drive up to the front. You can come up. We don't notice it as much, but that's the third floor, which is probably just above the flood. Um, parking lots in the flood, the roads in the flood, access is cut off. So there's definitely some significant impact. And so we're the, the options that we just presented are uh, a levy that we run along Bay Road in some configuration um, of the road. So, so that's kind of what that's showing. This is looking east. This is looking kind of from Route 9, Long Bay Road, East. And then if you go to the next slide. Um, so this is just look the same looking west. And you can see, you know, off in the distance in the background is in the intersection of Route 9, Bay Road, Route 9. And then the foreground is, is um, just past Lake Street. Um, mm -hmm. this is, or, oh, yeah, West Street and it's like the Bay Road. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so the green line is, is the levy. The, the yellow is the existing levy um, in the background. And so um, you can see how the hogs back properties. It's, it's tight in that area. You know, so you put the levy behind people's back there, but, but they're getting flood protected. So, uh, personally, I wouldn't mind that, but some people 
make those arguments. So it is their property. Um, so this is that alternative alignment to the field. So we just come down the hill and then it's line to the field. So it's nice and straight. Excellent. I'm sorry. Yes. I'll start raising my hand for the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have the clicker. <laughs> and I'm not doing a good job at profit. So. We'll have it next time. Sorry, we're getting close to the finish. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is just looking at that. Not, is it one slide? No, this is sorry. So again, the green is that central levy to the fields. Then we've got the taller. Um, then we got the clumper road. And there's a stream. If we're right where that kind of jogs to the right and back toward you mm -hmm. in the image, <clears throat> the stream. That's West Street, not Middle Street. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Not. Okay. And so people. Yeah, Middle Street's the next off. Yeah. And yeah. people out in the audience yeah. don't just understand. Thank you. Uh, so there's a stream crossing there. Uh, and, and that would have to be a closure structure that's environmental impact. There's environmental impact associated with all these options. Um, so that's something we have to account for. We have some costs to account for that, but that's one of the unknowns in these, are, in these alternatives is how much environmental mitigation might we have. And so um, that's challenging. We're going to start playing that. But this type of project would pretty much trigger every regulatory and environmental permit book. So um, not that it's not feasible, because there's a lot of reason, a lot of reason for flood, right? It's real property, real impact. We want to prevent impact and, and maybe flooding or avoid flooding. Um, so there are programs that are towards that. Um, but we also, we do need to consider the environmental components in order to opportunity to address those. Our next slide. <coughs> so this is just a summary of the alternatives. Um, you know, the first on the left is just Bring it up to spec 25 million. And really, what we wanted to show here is, is what's what's the level of protection that's being provided by the existing system? So a $25 million investment is protecting about 57 structures, which could be houses or a significant garage or something like that. It's probably something more than shit. Um, and then it's the, what we call exposure is sort of the, the value of that. Now, is that really the loss? Well, it depends on the level of flooding, the flood above the first floor or just a basement. So, it's, well, we're kind of looking at the value. We can call that exposure, like what's exposed, the value of assets or buildings that are exposed. And that's about 28.6 million um, in that area that's currently protected. And if you were to upgrade it to meet the high standards um, in future conditions, then it'd be a $25 million investment to maintain that protection. So we look at the alternative, and it's why we suggested this this evaluation in the first place. Is, well, we know that there's way more property, um, commercial, residential, um, that's not protected now, and a new levy could provide protection for a lot of properties. So if you look at the uh, the alternative or, or the new levy on Old Bay Road, it's about 218 structures and an exposure of about 72 million. I think that includes the existing protected area too. Yeah, so that's not. It's added, right? It's right. It's cumulative, right? So that includes the existing area plus the new within the newly protected area. And so that, you know, again, so you're protecting, you know, two and a half times the property, roughly, um, or a uh, cost that's, you know, more than double, but not the right. Um, so, we, you know, this is not what we call a true benefit cost analysis. That's a term that Amy uses where you have to use. Do a lot of analysis to get better data. Don't really have that right now. It's the planning level. Um, but those numbers seem to make sense. Like, well, it's a lot more structures, it's a lot more exposure that we would be addressing and protecting. It's a lot more investment. It's still a big number. But a lot of those properties are paying flood insurance now. So they have high premiums. So they're, they're paying for that. And that's, that's not flood protection. That's, that's recovery. And if you get it all really good cheap, actually loss, which doesn't cover everything. Of structure, not always business and impact. So, um, so anyway, so that, so that's those things to consider. I'll, I'll just try to wrap it up here in a couple more slides. Um, next, please. So, um, so when we look at, you know, our options, well, we have, you know, we want to continue to engage right for agencies. We have engaged in the scarlet process. And the town was able to receive a grant from the Army Corps of Engineers. It's a smaller silver jacket program. And so they, uh, a team of experts, we see all the folks listed on the right, which includes some town staff, but includes, you know, MEMA, Masters, management agency, regional planning agencies. Um, and so uh, it includes DCR. 
so on. Uh, you know. Um, so those stakeholders have, have come to meetings, but that's all going there. Is that engagement process? And that, what that's really helping is to help communicate risks to the community, taking our results that we found as what are the current and, and utilizing that to communicate risk, develop risk management tools. So it's to, to like, kind of take the information you have and then um, disseminate that better. Yeah. I think that's that's a challenge we see. Uh, I mean, I think you guys have heard enough about the levy. The public is always challenged to understand, you know, what is the human part, what's the hundred year flood plan, what is what's the real risk, and you know, how are we prepared? All those things. So, so that's a nice program that is ongoing. Um, and we did have some recent political engagement. You know, uh, Carolyn and we over the years, about a couple years we've talked about well, how do we how do we get more support for funding and for people to take these issues seriously? I mean, it takes fun events for people to start to pay attention more, but that's always looming in the future. So um, you know, uh the town was able to successfully engage Senator Comfort at meeting uh with, with her and team uh recently, it was about a month ago, maybe. Uh, and so, you know, they're suggesting that we continue this conversation and, and we work with other communities through a regional approach. And we shouldn't be doing it alone. There's support from agencies and others that really need to start to come to the table and take this issue seriously. Um, and we have some pretty good data for this, you know, much better than other communities in the Valley. Um, and so we can start to now be funding agencies and vet those things, you know, look at congressional earmarks and, and, and things like that. So it makes that funding challenge a little bit more uh, palatable in some ways, um, but something we still continue to work on. So, um, in terms of you know recommendations, we're going to uh, basically be developing a, a, a um, final technical network. So, I'll summarize this information. This is the the clip notes. Um, and then um, for the current letter, we're saying, well, with actually the third thing, evaluate funding. Let's continue to find sources of funding and and uh, in grants and, and loans and, and looking at. Advancing the planning effort, uh, some of these for design, uh, and, and some of that eventually for construction. And so, uh, looking at capital planning and maintenance, so I think that's something that the town is, is engaged in. What I've heard is interested in considering what we need to make sure we continue to do a high level of maintenance for the existing system. There's probably more funding that's needed for that um, each year. And um, but as far as the new levy, well, we still think we need to do additional terms analysis. You know, does it make sense to go through the field? How do people feel about that? Um, the environmental impact component of that is, is, is something that we just don't have enough information to you know, we probably engage with those agencies and back up a bit further. You know, look at alternatives for mitigation, which we think there are some in town. But you're cutting off a huge area of floodplain, which is designated as resource in Massachusetts. And we have to look at whether that could impact neighboring communities, downstream, upstream. And then ultimately, there's usually some compensatory storage mitigation to offset that. Not in all cases. So we did look at that a little bit. So, okay, well, the water surface elevation, I think it was 0.1 feet, water, 0.1 feet. It would be changed in elevation, just kind of within the degree of error for some of the data. Um, but it's enough to say, well, there could be some impact. If you were to construct a new levy, you're not allowing that water to come in, and it could raise the elevation of water to dry. You know, so that's that type of thing that you know would have to be refined and fed further. Um, I think you know the feedback from the agency so far has been positive in terms of you know having looking at this issue closer than we've seen other communities. Um, getting better information, better data. Uh, so and nobody's saying well, this you guys are crazy. <laughs> so um, you know, thinking. You know, continuing the conversation and continuing to do that with funding options um, is really what you know, sort of key recommendations. And so, in terms of next steps, um, we did have some pretty positive support from the center on um, getting in front of the Massachusetts Public Building Preparedness Program to look at grant opportunities. If you look at it in the past, it's just been challenging to advance the project because we didn't have the information yet. Right? So, we have enough information to say, look, we, we think there's an alternative. Option that we'd like to evaluate. Yes, we need to look at major based solutions or things that you know they want to see us look at as part of a holistic project. Um, but we there's support to advance that and, and then have champions at, at a state level to, to help support that and, and hopefully get an application to advance under the plan. That's something that we're gonna you know we'd like the time to focus on. Um, 
we haven't talked about yet, but probably looking at a match, there's a match component to that, that opens up in the spring, in terms of funding opportunities. So that's kind of an you know, immediate thing that we could focus on, aside from the bigger picture of, of the bigger numbers of funding. You haven't mentioned the federal government yet, and I know that there's been some conversation with Jim McGovern's office um, about this, and I, and I believe yeah. the state and federal government, the state potentially looking to the federal government. Yeah, um, that's, that's essentially government. right. Um, so, so that's so starting with, with Senator Conover, she indicated that she was interested in championing the stuff for having for other communities and, and elevating that to the state level governor. And then to the so that's they use the money triples through that way in the best. Um, we need to make more push it for now. Yeah, that's the idea. And that makes these, you know, it starts to put these massive projects into reach for some communities. And if nothing else, it allows additional resources to focus on the region and, and continue to advance this. But well, these are not um, easy projects, they're complicated and take a long time to really get through planning. Design, permitting, and then eventually mm -hmm. so it's a multi they're multi year projects. Um, so I think things are moving in the right direction. There is positive feedback about what having schools not to play, and, and the fact that there's real need to address these issues, and, and that you know, but obviously these systems have been built in all across the country. They were built either by the core or others. Um, years were probably built by farmers. No, it was built yeah. by the army. Well, it was like, yes. Paris. Yeah. We but, did not want to have anything to do oh, of course. with helping yeah. us repair what we needed to repair. Right. So that's the challenge. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in Hatfield, we, did, we were meeting some people over there. We had a public meeting. And um, some of the farmers had actually, you know, their father, great father, um, had actually done some more than what Because it was very from the kids, essentially. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, that's how this has happened. And, and maintenance and the ultimate. It's, it's sort of unrealistic for communities of the size to maintain that, that piece of infrastructure when um, you know nobody does it. So, so it's a big challenge. Um, next, I guess it's fine. But last slide, um, probably three weeks away. Three minutes, yeah. <laughs> this is yeah, I, I just had this up here kind of general questions like, yeah, just what do you think about next steps? Is this aligning with including the goals? Um, yeah, but anyway, just your feedback and questions, comments. I mean, it's the biggest issue space in the town right now. Yes, you know, I think everybody can get their head wrapped around the protection of, of you know, low income property. So, uh, I guess, question I have is, uh, you know, do you have an opinion on what we could or should be doing any differently, accelerating certain activities to be as we're going to call it shovel ready as possible if we're able to secure funding at some point. I mean, it sounds to me like the, the whole conversation around Old Bay Road is pretty pretty significant. And personally, it makes yeah. sense to me. But when you talk about the Old Bay Road, you're looking at the picture of it and the dike, new one, the food yeah. there yeah. in between. The fields that are being farmed mm -hmm. and the river on the other side, plus you have houses on that other side that have the river behind them. So now we're making it like uh, could be a waterway actually for the houses that are already back there. You know, you're kind of tightening them yeah. in to that one certain section of um, Appleby Road, which kind of makes me a little bit leery. Because that field does flow every year. Yeah. And this year with its worst, we had, as you know, I mean, I'm not repeating anything that people don't already know about the amount of uh, damaged crops and things that our farmers yeah. had to endure this year. And part of that was but down in there and down in the cemetery road area also, which is the abuts the other side of the, mm -hmm. uh, the river dike. Right. So so uh, so the what we propose was protection structure primarily. And so to capture the structures, our structure right along the river that, that are so far from what we're proposing that we have to extend the levee substantially to protect those. And, and honestly, it's cheaper just to relocate them or them off fire or do other measures to protect them. Um, now, the fields are different. So there's, there's obviously a fact there. This is a big conversation in Hatfield when we're there, Republican farmers. Um, and so because there's, there's impact at a 
it, it doesn't need to reach the 100 year flood. It doesn't need to be anything more than what we saw. And in fact, probably less would be some similar impact, right? So there's real impact to with that. Now, uh, we have to consider whether it's cost beneficial to, to mitigate that, uh, with extension of that, that legacy. Uh, you know, so there, there's, you know, we recognize that. We didn't evaluate that specifically. We have to consider the value of that loss. Um, and then probably the, you know, the frequency of that and really look at, you know, more benefit cost analysis. There are programs for recovery. I know it doesn't pay for everything that farmers lose, um, but there is money. And that was something that was, uh, Senator Comfort kind of championed for some of the farmers in the area. Yeah, I think it was 30 million, um, in, in recovery money. Yeah. But that, that like kind of keeps the lights on for everybody, you know, so they still have a loss. Um, uh, but it helped. Helps uh, in addition to whatever help they got in their insurance or, or federal programs for, for farms. Um, so I, I guess I don't have a great answer as to how we didn't evaluate that yet. That could be something that could be part of the next steps to consider, you know, some level of protection, maybe. Maybe it's, it's we look at a level of protection that is not as high, but takes care of the more frequent, smaller events that, you know, just don't reach that 100 year base flood elevation. Uh, it would be a less expensive system, but we're talking a pretty big area. So our, our gut feeling is it's just, you know, it's, it's too costly. Um, yeah. And the 25 million that you're talking about, that's only running on the north side of the um, Connecticut River, correct, for the repairs, that yes. 25, 25 just million. The <laughs> <laughs> just not the, the and, that, and, that's, and that's just half. Mm -hmm. That doesn't extend beyond Northampton or whatever, or take over on the other side of that field either, which is up, yeah. which abuts us on the other oh, side of the river. So, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I'm talking about A lot of the dike, as you can see, when you look over there in the water, there is no levee on the other side, uh, right there, you know, so that the water flows right into the fields at Hatfield also. So I mean you've got right. you've got both areas of concern, you know, either it's this way or that way. You know, this way. Yeah, and, and Hatfield's levy does provide some protection with fields, but there are fields that are still open, which is a there and it had it. Um and, and one of the mitigation opportunities is actually taking cross path levy, removing it, and then rebuilding the higher new one for reconstructing it further to the east. Which would open up more floodplain to flood more fields, but that would be the mitigation to open up and restore floodplain. So that that's a bit of a conflict, obviously, uh, but it's that would be an environmental mitigation opportunity. I mean, the soils are what they are because of sediment deposition from flooding. However, crops are impacted due to water quality issues, and then they can't solve it. So it's kind of a different. You know, I, I think one of our main goals, but especially after. I was on the board when we did the six hundred thousand dollar repair to the thing itself, um, which uh, ended up to be a cluster um, because of everything that went on there. The bad soil having to put, you know, steel down into the river to hold back the dike. I mean, they had to do a whole bunch of other right. things after their initial start on that. It just ended up to be. Horrific, but you know, that's part of our maintaining size to make sure that there are no breaks in it, you know, as it's going right. along. And that's a lot of tree head insurance, you know, DBW does there are fire emergency. Yeah, yeah so there, there are a couple areas, especially the beginning of the levee, for this upstream portion along the river where there is erosion and some repair work that needs to be done. Now, if you're going to start repairing it, might want to just reconstruct that cycle. Yeah, you know, it's kind of, you know, once you start touching it, you really have to do it right. Um, so, but in terms of repair and, and upgrade of existing system, you can get a base part. You can do some segments. So, if you're going to repair it so it keeps the same condition, well, let's upgrade that segment and then we phase it. You know, so, we can start to look at things in that manner, um, not have to do all of this. Um, in terms of shovel ready projects, to answer your question, I guess. I mean, um, everything requires some level of effort to get in front of it. So if there's a design effort, uh, I think, you know, if there were repairs, some upgrades at some locations, 
that may make sense to have a smaller profit that's shovel ready, but to have this whole profit shovel ready is, is a huge effort because you have to have permitting a lot of things already teed up or pretty far along. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some. Yeah. You have to be clear, you have to take the key to what happened there now. You can't just forget about it. Or right. you're really going to run into a bigger problem. I mean, I know that that six hundred thousand dollar project that we did is only that year, those years that we were doing that. But there were others years before that were further up towards North Hadley that had already been prepared. Also, so I mean, yeah. As we go along in years, each segment is going to erode or move away because of the flow of the water. That's just natural. Uh, yeah. And, and that, that upstream segment that I'm talking about at the very beginning of it is where the river bends sharply mm -hmm. and it takes the most force and most erosion. And, and that hasn't been repaired in the past like Army Corps back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that is, yeah, it's a better, you know, yeah, you, you guys understand that there are areas that over time become more susceptible. And at some point they do fail, mm -hmm. and we want to avoid that. So, um, so I think taking a phased approach to make sure we address things that are higher priority, like that area. Um, we don't want to just pause, figure out the solution for everything without addressing that along the way. Yeah. So, so you can't you just we don't want to prolong those things too much. Right. Um, so that would be kind of a you know, in our recommendations, we'll have sort of some priorities, I think, in terms of this that's an area that we should focus on the, in terms of funding and design to advance that. I guess that would be the stage of the Taking care of what needs to be taken care of now, then looking as we advance to take care of the, the future, you know, um, and not just not way in the future, but short future. Right. And getting so we get, we can look at what that level of investment would be, give you some funding sources that are available for that type of activity. I know, I know Army Corps is starting to look at, at this issue closer. They're realizing that everybody's in the same situation. Not a lot of assistance. What it seems like the repair has commonly been point deferred maintenance by the agencies and that they don't fund that. They don't want to fund something that you can't maintain yourself already. And that's not always the case because in, in this situation, we also have a lot of the design standards because they didn't exist. Then. So we can look at it as an upgrade. And that's an investment in the capital project infrastructure. Yes, you're addressing the repair on the way. But you're, if you're, you're meeting higher design criteria for greater protection, yeah, that puts it into the category. So I think we have to start to look at it that way and try to get that one. Karen, are there um, specific decisions that you want to make tonight that to provide you with direction to move forward? No, but we're, um, we have, I think we have pretty good plan to move forward. And um, I think the most important thing is you guys have been asking for updates, yeah. update on it. So around June, as well as the public. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, Seems like the next big thing is we should, um, and then doesn't necessarily involve you, but maybe it's something we should be having a conversation about targeted communication. Um, you know, who is most likely to be impacted if we did decide? Well, we would have, I, I believe, we would have to have um, informational exactly. yeah. session. So, yeah. so part part of the work with the silver jackets is probably going to involve you know, finding out those theories that are going to be more discussed. That's what it is. That the that grant is to help educate and provide a resource for those that are in the Okay, great. The one question I'd like you to answer for the public was: If one hundred eighty thousand gallons should be thousand gallons, what was the flow of? I'll give you. I'll let you. <laughs> And, and just to confirm, I want to confirm the number. I believe it was 100,000 CFS was the close in July that raised the, that, that gave you the visible flooding you saw. And so, and that's that's one point actually I wanted to make earlier. I could have got the line. Uh, but uh, is, and, and it's, it's kind of a, your point earlier is that this levy provides protection today and we want to protect that. And and so doing the maintenance that we want to do is important or maybe more important than than evaluating the the bigger project and um uh, and so and then doing the repairs as that's where it should discuss. But that's uh because if you do protection today and for all types of events, not just these big events that, that we designed to or 
and, and really we're designing to that event plus several feet of freeboard so that that protection is guaranteed, you know, as far as being concerned. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's really important to do that. That's, that's where you want to focus. The other point I was going to make earlier about pushing levy to the edges, uh, the challenge with that one, you squeeze the river, so you raise the river. Uh, but also, there are several structures along the edge, and all those would have to go away, you know, to build it. And it'd be a massive levy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are definitely some examples about that, that out there. I think it's one of West Virginia that I, I worked on uh, several years ago. And, uh, and they're just massive structures. You can just put it right up one level and have it go up to the top of the line. So uh, that's why they become... They just become so large and, and so big they get really expensive as a challenge. If you raise the existing levy for <laughs> like set, mm -hmm. how much are you going to have to widen the base on the side opposite the river? There's two parts to that. I don't know the dimension um, that that would be because it puts away more obviously along the levy. But uh, we would be along the levy yet. We wouldn't need to pull it back. One of the things. The levy really shouldn't be the bank of the river. There needs to be a bank of the river and the so and then the levy behind that. And right now, the, the one of the challenges so um, is the so the river, you know. And so, so we need to move back. I don't know if we had an exact number of how that be there. Yeah. So, so we, um, it varies, like Joe said. Yeah. Generally, we're we're trying to get a slope. That for every foot up, we go three feet out. So if we raise it four feet, we go twelve out. That's just we raise the height, but now it's thirty two feet. So we probably, you know, it's probably looking at somewhere uh, twenty feet or greater on uh, landward side, so the, the dry side, lake side, river side town. So we, in order to stabilize that, are looking at different alternatives that are um, sometimes sheeting. Sometimes that's just that's the way to do it, and basically poor driving sheeting. Uh, we can also uh, set the soil with uh, compounds and, and increase the, the stability properties. So um, um, no matter what you do, it's going to impact landowners. You're going to, it's not going to just be, oh, you're going to add something to the height and everything's right. going to remain the same. Yeah. Everything's going to involve like, land. You can, so we can do some that creative things to limit the footprint for everything. Uh, and I think it's some, some part of the alternatives for, you're basically putting like a wall. Inside the core of it, you know, so it's a narrow filter. It's just a wall that goes up three or four feet. Uh, the most aesthetically pleasing, you walk along it, maybe it's another thing that maintains the structure, maintain it is costly. Um, but you could do that and avoid having to pop it out as much. You just kind of get that extra four feet of height. But when you're doing six, eight, or ten feet of increase, it, it, it becomes that wall becomes a significant structure with a significant foundation, becoming very sense very fast. It is because it has to hold back foot one, you know. So, um, a couple feet, few feet, maybe buys a little bit in tight areas. That's a better alternative. But generally, you know, in the beginning of the look, look at the upstream side, there is room. I say room, it's, it's property, there's no house there. You could pull it back. So, there's essentially you're looking at pulling back from the river and needing to slope back and then building the time in your floor. So it could be some areas could be substantial because it's so steep already. Mm -hmm. It could be it could be forty feet. Uh, there, uh, you know, in terms of other locations that have constraints, like you have the lantern, which is right against the level at that section. So there's not much we can do in that area unless you get a lot of the land along to play with that. Just the last thing we can also do. We capped it already, Jake. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so there's some challenges like that along it. Um, but yeah, that's that's um we did factor that it took the cost of so we get this feasible in each of those those areas. Well probably this will take another meeting. And then so so thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I think Carol and I you know, what one thing I was just gonna suggest is something entertaining. Um I, I think we're talking potentially to be a capital project for Ball, which could be used as match for a spring ramp. That's at cool. that point. Yeah. 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 So that's the kind of thing. We'll, we'll work on that behind the scenes as we wrap up the report. Perfect. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Switch. Oh. Yeah. Oh.
Toronto. Okay. So moving on. Um, Gordon Twain's Gordon Here. Yeah. Yeah. Adam here as well. I don't see Adam being Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? Well, I don't know what to say. And, uh, you know, I'm here because uh, I've been living in this town for 28 years. And, uh, you know, I have come on in the in the town. Uh, Jennifer and I had a very brief discussion. She said, and now I used to be an engineer, now I'm a realtor. She said, this is a zooming for the field. It's a good place uh, I can contribute. Uh, well, I see any questions. I, I don't know what else do I need to present. Have you looked into what the Zoning Board of Appeals does? Uh, yeah, I, I did some online reading, you know, like, a, I really had a zero idea when, uh, uh, five years ago, but, uh, but uh, I, after I become a realtor, I have to, you know, have to get a more exposure about the different zones, uh, and uh, uh, after I talked to Jennifer, I, I did some online reading about the state and mm -hmm. conflict of interest, so... The DBA and uh, I look at some funds uh, and the our 177 page of our funds, uh, you know, so you know. So, but I I assume I don't need to be because I I look at our board of Tony board of appeal and the lawyers as a experience with people, I guess it want to be, I think a uh, volunteer like me, we just, I do whatever <laughs> needs to be done. I assume I don't need to be good that high. But, uh, so you're, you're, you have engineering background? Yeah, I'm an engineer. Okay, so you can deal with facts. You facts. can deal with facts. Fact, F-A-C-T-F. Facts. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. and I'm good at it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are you afraid to tell people no? I'm not really. I, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> In essence, cops don't care about their feelings. <laughs> well, I think that uh, actually, to a certain extent, uh, being an engineer background, I mean, I'm so focused on data and the facts, and then spending too much time. But, Learning that like, it's actually almost a negative for me being a road trip, but, you know, to some people maybe it's a positive, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm pretty lousy at marketing. <laughs> Which area of engineering were you in? I'm a materials engineer. Sounds good to me. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'm going to make a motion to accept Iris on the zoning board of appeals. I'll second it. What well, well, you can recommend to me what to read? I mean, what to do? There's actually training available, uh, which will be. Oh, okay. yeah. And I would be more than happy to have a lengthy discussion with you about what my feelings about what the zoning board of appeals is all about. Okay. Um, it's uh, Thank you. yeah. So. I live right up the street from you, um, and whatever, I'll, I think I have your phone number on your application, so um, I'll be happy to call you, and we can talk. And oh, thank you. I thought it was a recommended piece of a link. Well, that's <laughs> so true. Always that too. We, I'll be happy to do that as well, but there's just things that I've been dealing with that kind of stuff for a long time. And it's a pet peeve of mine, so I would love to chat with you. Thank you. And then I think another resource for you, Iris, is the planning board. <clears throat> um, and I'm sure, you know, again, just to give you kind of a, a an overview of the types of um, things that have gone to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, if they can do it in a very dispassionate way, 
Mm -hmm. So maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe Bill Dwyer might get a call and ask if he might be able to have a conversation with you. Thank you. And, and you said you, you read the conflict of interest and, and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, you did the yeah, open meeting? The state website has a, has a chapter on so you need more of appeal also, yeah, different uh, conflict of interest a lot. And uh, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, the town doesn't have a link, but it has all these uh, down, uh, PDF files, you know, has a lot of details. But I assume this, uh, uh, I see there is Andrew from the beer. Excuse my pronunciation. There were, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there were five people. I assume they are the expert at the handling a volunteer just to do small things. <laughs> I assume. Have you have you looked at any of their meetings? Has it been on YouTube? Uh, I did actually. Uh, I, I, I think so. Okay. Right, well, let me just. Uh, there was a motion by Joyce and a second by oh, um, Jane. No, we're having a discussion. So now I'm <laughs> um, You're aware that it's a three member board? Even though there's five people, it's only a three member board. So you you cannot have conversations with anybody on the board relative to anything before you. Otherwise, you break a meeting law. So be aware of that, please. Yeah. And there, there's a hand uh, committee handbook that won't well, we'll 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 don't we don't want to over it right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, what's that? Yeah. The point, I mean, my my public concern is not do anything, you know, breaking the law or, 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 or anything wrong. So I I think the first thing I would like to know, you know, which meeting is a public. I mean, I I look everywhere to see whether today's meeting is a public, but the uh, uh, I think I guess other other outside that was asking this gentleman. Am I allowed to be here? Mm -hmm. yeah, because, yeah. You know, all towns are open to the open meeting. So Iris, we can um myself, Carolyn, and Jennifer, we can help you with some of that. When you get sworn in, you'll have to get sworn in for that. I think I know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it might sound like that. They're, they're, they just want to make sure you know everything, but I think they're thrilled. That, yeah, yeah they're awesome. said, thrilled by what we're hearing. But I just want to, you know, when you get sworn in, a clerk, Jessica, she's going to give you a slip of paper that will have those websites for you to take conflict of interest um, and the meeting on day in conflict of interest. So we'll help you through it. We're upstairs. If you need some guidance and make sure, make sure. Yeah. Girl, yeah. Yeah, so all those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Perfect. One welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> I'm just conscious of time. Okay. We must jump. So, topic up? Yes. The financial thing? No, so which one? Jones, the, um, the phone side. Okay. Carol, better this is five six. Five six. Oh, Carol and benefits is system. No. All right, you should go ahead with Scott's. It's not quite on the channel. Sure, and then. Good evening. Good evening, Troy. So we're not doing that over to my cousin. All right. All right. Are you doing Jones now? Come on, Pat. Let's get on the side. Move it. No, no preference. See, he's on the side of it. Turns are showing off the joists. Don't be overdoing it. Why would that be better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Troy, are you leading off for a while? No, you can go ahead. Oh, you can go ahead. Okay. So um we are we are asking, requesting to have a full-time HR assistant whose primary function is going to assist with payroll and benefits. Um we are asking for this 
a number of reasons. One of them is one of the topics we're dealing with now is succession planning. Maybe getting my 60th birthday has me thinking about it more. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, I recently had knee surgery, so I was out for three weeks. And that had me doing a lot of thinking about this succession plan because of the fact that we had a part time person who it was great when we got a part time person, was, we, we got this. But uh, the, the offices had split, so the treasurer's office was treasurer's office, and the jail was full. And having a part time help was wonderful. But we found over time that that was enough. There was a time to train beyond. Doing cable entry, the day it was person was only 29 hours for two week period, so they would have three days long to process payroll and then maybe one week or something of one day. And I found while I was on leave that that wasn't sufficient, and there was a lot of work with that to be done from home. Luckily, I had a laptop and access to everything at work, so I was able to help on board and join. Make some termination paperwork on employees and get benefit packages out to them. Um, but it just really opened my eyes to the fact that we don't have someone to cover that in my absence. And luckily, it was just a short term absence. Got a bit of this. Ah, I didn't know that was. Um, so we're looking at that. And I know one of the questions. That's going to pop into a lot of people's minds right away. Is we have an HR director yet? Well, yes. But that HR director was not hired for like a month. That HR director was there to take the burden off of the town administrator, department heads, in dealing with renegotiations, hiring, grievances, policies. As well as to make sure the town's in compliance with state and federal law, labor laws, particularly. Not to say we're not perfect in that neighborhood. It's a little help. And our part time assistant at this point in time, when I got back to work, notified us that she decided to have a job where she has gotten a promotion and will not be getting a job. So we're crying to us. So I thought, what a great opportunity. Maybe we'll move forward with talking to everyone. The person will be on between the day of entry and the new processing, employee benefits, that hiring, separation, and retirement, workers' comp claims, unemployment, wellness program, and last but not least, covering my not sick or on vacation. Uh, and Maybe I'll start working on the You go home. Can we hold you to the You can. That's my promise. So you're basically going to do the table now. Um, I don't continue to do what I've been doing, but to have someone else also be there to help with it mm -hmm. and, learn it. and learn it. And also, I mean, but honestly, when I got back, just coming back in, and Troy had been out following me. When he got back, I handed him a stack of paperwork. I think I had 42 personnel action forms for him to sign off on. And that meant he was sending out hiring packets, sending out separation packets. Mm -hmm. and the majority of that was done from home. Yeah, I mean, I think from a, from a customer's, I mean, I was looking at uh, the HR function, it's a customer service job. It is. Right. I mean, you're there to support the, the Absolutely. town. Your primary interaction is all the employees of the town. And, and it's not just payroll, it's in the class with the number of email requests we have for information or questions, walk ins, mm -hmm. and retirees also. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of stuff. Maybe people don't realize it's quiet and we don't want to sit there. Maybe it's all about social security. It's all of us. I'm 100% behind. And I, I would say, sorry, it's awesome about food because not all. I don't even realize that I have a laptop and check out the mails. 
Should they not ask you? It's not there. On a, it's a, it's a typical week with your part time help, how many hours are you working beyond what you should be? I have 37 and a half hours a week. I have accumulated what I can. Um, my time at home was sick time. It's my case. Uh, volunteers, which I believe the town is But you'll be poor. Such a nice but I think Randy was sort of getting in, you know, because you're scheduled to set it. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't believe that's the number of So, yes. Yeah. So, I asked the question so that we can justify saying, well, Joan is working way too many hours, paying this part time. So, the difference between right. your overage and that is probably going to equate to probably. what you're asking. Or both two. Some things we're not going to do. I push a lot of times to say, okay, priority is important. It's a legal. And it is pushed aside. I totally support this. And I would like to have, because presidents are going to say to us, can you easily or not easily? Give me a graph of the growth of the employees in the town over the last number of years. I don't know how easily. I don't know how the most awesome equipment <laughs> or programs out there. People don't seem to understand. I mean, I like what I see in this brochure. It shows the, the rate of growth. It right. shows a lot of things like that. Population's growing, but in order to serve that population, you need more staff. But it has changed literally yeah. over the 26 years I've been here. Exactly. And so, yeah. Jane, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's changed. It's not so much that it's five or 15 more employees. It's all of the classic mm -hmm. unfunded mandates coming down from the state of government. It's completely yes. changed here. Yeah. Yes. So, so it's it's remember when we do this, and this person is, is this person going to be 37 and a half like you? We would like that. And they are also, my help is too, um, because I know I feel myself moving into a little bit more to pull out of the cabinet HR director and help me do some and their too. So and we're going we'll to do some of those things maybe too, in terms of getting letters here. So where will the money come from to for, for the rest of 20? Well, I don't think that. If we did it this year, um, you have the 29 hours from the one that's well, we're moving right out of 14, 14 and a half hours right now. Yeah. And for funding for this year, it would be between, depending on the rate, so it would be $23 and $25 an hour. Um, so the additional funding for FY24 would be $73,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that what this per, per, I have to add? I mean, what's the what's the going rate, starting rate? Yes, it is. I mean, because we're you know we're doing this yeah, whole uh, thing right now. Uh, and she came in with um, educational knowledge. Yeah, not so much She's very good. She's small. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Make a motion to approve the recommendation that we move forward this year with the hire of the HR and the assistance of the hotel. Yeah. Second. Motion by Mollins, Joyce, and further discussion. All right, all those in favor? Aye. First, excellent. Go home. Thank you. 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 very much. <laughs> Sorry, Troy, are you all set? <laughs> yes, thank you. Good job, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> I said, listen, Troy. Thank you. Sorry, Okay. I'm just jumping back to old things for a while. You know? So, uh, for a point of brief, I'm changing back. Make a motion to approach. Second. Motion, I'm Jane? Uh, any discussion? So it's just we're voting to approve 
his benefit to kids. Yes. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Excellent. Um, in new business, we're right, going to we need to drop a around or we good to go straight down the line. I think we're good. Okay. okay. Um, so, Algonquin ARCA funding. Um, and this here is long for that. So I'm going to pop up to the front here um, for an update uh, on the restoration on the Algonquin Drive. And just to talk on the new money side of it, because we are asking for funds to come to the park. Um, I did load it up into four, do I do it? Are you ready to share that? It's a We have it on the front. We have it on the front. We have it. Oh, that's right. Like, that's not it. No, no, I can talk to you about the whole thing. Okay. So, when we were looking at the money, this is that this is on the special funding mean, warrant, but when we took a look at the ARPA, it looks like it's um, something that will fit in and, and be consistent with how we spent the money in the past. So what I did was a calculation of the money that we got in ARPA and how we have been spending it. So the first column, it says spending plan, and these are the projects and the spending that were approved by um, Select board and or town meeting. If I, I jump to the bottom first, where it says used in the operating budgets, that's where the bulk of our money went into funding our 22 and our 23 budgets. Um, when we were, we, uh, it, it's called a replacement of the loss, replacement of revenue. Um, and that's part of, um, that's a part of the setting that is the most important to our continuing our level of operations. So that is about a million dollars that went in. And then um, the rest uh, rest of it uh, we used for the town projects. Um, these were all brought to you um, before the projects were taken on. Newton Lane, Bay Road, Fresh Street, Algonquin, East Street, and South Maple, and also a street kind of project. So that was 223500 in projects that would benefit um, the town. Um, and uh, a couple of other items of this, uh, that continued, and we started spending this to continue into the next year, where the trailers were approved for 50000 That was the VW trailers. As it turns out, we did get some earmarked funds to cover the trailers, and once they were put in, we had the 50000 left over. The Route 9, uh, the extension, since we had the Route 9 project going on, there's extension down South Maple Street, um, which was very economical to take on at that time and would improve the water going down that, uh, uh, down that section of the town. And so that's 360,000 between those two. So that pretty much, except for that last item called unallocated funds, uh, just a small cushion there of 34,000. That covers the entire amount that we were granted under our own. Um, then the projects were undertaken, and uh, some of the allocated projects ran a little over and some were under, but on balance, we had $13,000 left over, $13,851 left over in those projects. As I said, we had an entire $50,000 left over uh, in trailers. Uh, we ended the year um, with a balance um, of 125000 and then going into this next year, more has been spent on Route 9, and I believe that's been completed. So what we have left over, everything's been done. We have the 13000 from the initial project. We have 55000 almost from the Route 9 balance and the trailers. And then the unallocated amount, thirty-four thousand, gives up to the hundred two thousand seven hundred and five dollars. It seems to be a very consistent use, as you can see, all of it was on this list mm -hmm. originally. Very consistent with how we have used the um, ARPA money right from the start, and a good way. As we went to town meeting, we would be uh, tapping into free cash. This money is here; they can get going on the project. There's other things to to say about the project, obviously. 
probably from um, stock property to take from there, but I want to let you know where we still are, but and uh, this is probably used to come. So the whole amount will go towards this project? I think that you're talking about it being 100000 Okay. Talk. Thank you. Don't go fire your next up anyway. So I think but they want to, yeah, I, I think it's like add to that. I, I have um had contact with uh I sent an email to Senator Comerford and Representative Carey. Um I think Scott, you had talked with Representative Carey early on. Mm -hmm. Right. But what they would uh what we're setting up is a meeting to meet with them um, yeah. just to talk about they're both very awesome. As you know, this is a DEP requirement that we do this. And um, I think it's important there. They're definitely willing for us, Jennifer, for the meeting for us to all get together and talk about, you know, something like this, how it impacts a small town. That, you know, if, if, if we weren't able to fund this, we didn't have time meeting, or we certainly didn't have our phone work. You felt that it was an investment for our club. We could be faced um, with a critical shortfall um, if it did not get past the meeting. And so they they understood the magnitude of that. Um, and I think they need to hear more about impacts on small towns when regulations come through and how it impacts us that we don't have that price. We don't have 100,000 of them sitting around. Um, so I just wanted to add that that we have had contact with the DEP for several weeks in Boston and the Senator of the Nurses. And the DEP is not backing down at all. Okay, so we have make a motion to approve the use of our, the, up to the remaining balance of our funds for the Algonquin project. Second. Motion by Molly, second. Choice for discussion. Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. All right. Well done, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we'll do the financial update next. Um, just going to update on the current town incidents. Yep. Yeah. Uh, financial update. First, I just want to say. That we did close on band. Remember all the borrowing we did it last year's special down thing. Um, we did do a lot of the borrowing. It's not a little bit in the spring, but mostly we did it in September for those uh, projects that have been um, purchased and moved along in the past year. So we had a one point eight million dollar bond, which you all thank you for coming in and signing and taking care of that. It, the uh, bond on the band, I mean, all oh, right. Band went to being a cooperative bank at an interest rate of 0.75%. So that was a good chunk of the, of the borrowing we're going to have. There'll be some more coming up. And um, so that's where we're seeing on that. 4.75% is about 4% higher than when I started, but we're at, where our bands were under 1%. So it's something to keep in mind as we move through um, the rest of our borrowing and our path plan. For our, um, so I got, I did my usual quarterly reports and these the ones as at the end of FY23. And the one most significant we're going into town meeting, as usual, is general funds. Um, so if you have that one, <laughs> you do want this. If you have a general fund, I know they have it. Uh, yeah. But, um, I mean, I have to work on this. I just want to make sure people can see it. So, um, we had a really good year on balance as far as the revenues coming in above. Um, the revenues came in about $853,000 more than what we had projected. And that was great. As you can see, we ended the year uh, as a highlighted column going up, uh, highlighted row going across. Our revenues came in just over $19,000. Our expenses came in um, $50,000 of our actual revenues, that's actual revenues. So even though we allocated a car fund and free cash to balance the budget, budget we ended up not using it, which contributes to our having a free cash balance scans. 
Um, I did meet with the accountant today to go over and make sure is this, is this, is this a good enough rough start as to where we're going to be with uh, free cash? I said, yeah, this is one of what they attack in a few different ways, but this one lets me know that you're in the ballpark. So with our revenues coming in, 853,000 higher than we expected um, or than we projected, and the expenses coming in, $504,000 lower than what had been budgeted. That's a difference of one million three hundred fifty-eight thousand. So we already have free cash to start. So we are looking at free cash in about that area. There's ups and downs and other things that to do that adjust to come up with your actual free cash figure. But thinking um, to have in mind that we have about one point three million in free cash coming into this year is a good way to think of it. So that is our general cover report. Do you have any questions? Are we going to be dealing with finance? Are we going to be dealing with finance? Yeah, not the financial management team. The, the actual finance committees. Finance committee. Well, we were talking about the schedule, right? Finance committee. So, yeah, finance committee does have to meet. And it was, I know that they were waiting until, I think they'd be waiting until after the capital management committee was done because they can then vote on those budgets. Um, and those articles on session can't be boring. So they will have to get going, we were thinking, in the next week or two. So we'll have to talk with Amy about it. Or David, wait until I guess the chair will come back in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the plan. And the other uh, three reports are on the enterprise funds, the water, the sewer, and the media. They came in much closer to what had been projected. We don't have you know, we already know, you already know you've dealt with the water and sewer that we needed to raise the race. Um, they are both continuing in the trend of expenses exceeding the revenues. So, um, with the increased rate, that should help. We did not take an uh, effect um, in time for these, but we're still okay. We are afloat, but we will be doing better with raising rates. So. Um, this is the middle of September now. We will have the first quarter reports. Um, hopefully, so it takes, a, it takes quite a while for them to pull together at the end of the year. They work on that. Um, we really just had the final figures from the account last week. We had estimates. We, like I said, we, were, we had a good idea that we were here, but I got the final figures and was able to do the reports. Now, um, the first quarter reports for July, August, September, I should have been. So, We'll know where we stand, and hopefully we'll have free cash sometime um, then and before time to get as well. So we'll have this happen. And that's the Okay. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Are you welcome to try this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So you have before you the, uh, the the first draft. Well, it's probably several drafts from the RFAP, but the first one that you're seeing. Um, so I just want to just um, kind of just remind everybody what special town meetings are. You know, special town meetings are typically for it's not really a second annual town meeting. So we've been um, very specific. That this is really keeping towards what usually around the central town meeting, and usually it is um, there's personnel adjustments, usually depending upon collective bargaining agreements that have been that have been negotiated and need to be ratified. Um, there's also um, prior year invoices that can't be paid after the fiscal year closure in prior years. There's capital requests, CPA requests. Um, it, um, you'll see on there the opioid. Uh, to a few articles on that and how that we accept those funds and um, administer those funds. And that's those are regulated, regulated, those are deadlines that we have to, we can't wait till annual time meeting. Um, and usually a new or revised bylaw. Um, so it's, you know, it's got to clear your consent agenda or, you know, if, if you're having any other increases that can't wait until uh, the annual time meeting. So it's in front of you. I don't know how you'd like to proceed. If you want to go over it, but be able to read it, I'll keep it on here updated. 
um, or I can send it to you as, as uh, Linda updates it so that you can see it, but it's pretty straightforward and we are going to talk in one of the next agenda I believe to talk about one of the articles that was on there is, um, in regards to private way and how town addresses private way. So um, is there any questions you have right now to take a look at? I know I realize you're just getting it today. So yeah, I'm um, just going to say, I mean, just, just because we didn't get it too far in advance of the meeting, maybe give us time to read every last one. Yeah. 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 We, were, we were still making changes up until they were gone. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to leave it on the um, like every, for every yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'll also, I also send it to you, but I don't know. I'm like, don't want to inundate you with eight million different directions. But I don't think it's going to change that much. This is another no, 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 If you want me to go through the gym. Oh, that's. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need to go through. You want? You don't want to go through it? Okay. okay. So, no. no. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Or on financial things, and just just generally. Uh, with what we, we you know the usual increase in the in the budget and I've been I just started the sheet that we do is how much is coming out of each source of what we're going to be spending and those I have to still be concerned when we have free cash I'm going to be spending all that free cash you no know, we're not going to be spending all, not all that free cash and some of the free cash that we are spending technically is subject to grants and I'll be moving a hundred thousand out right away because you're going to be using it, you're using ARPA instead. So um, there will be that kind of shift, and I'd be happy to uh, maybe send it by, by email when we have the adjustments based on tonight. Uh, and then capital planning committee is still working; they're finishing up on um, on Monday. So there's a number of capital items, but um, but they are dead. They are dead solution. We were just talking a bit ago about the one point, you know, the high number of borrowings that we had last um, last fall. We don't have that this fall, mm -hmm. so we have um, less than hundred thousand dollars being in capital being spent out of free cash, um, and nothing coming out of water or sewer reserves. This is a drastically different than last year, so except the little, but except the debt exclusion articles, which are. Which will are quite um, large. We haven't had that exclusion for a while, so we do have uh, three that will be subject to that exclusion overlap. So I guess at the next meeting, get into more specifics on those. Do you know, we know the CPA meeting? They're on there, they're done. Oh, well, they've already worked. There's one uh, there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that just went on this week. I just saw the other two again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, articles eight and nine are data. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm dealing with the open work. It's all obvious. Fine, it's all. Okay. So we'll be back. All right, time. Thank you. 5.4, 5.4 way. Oh. I can kind of help with that. But, yeah. Um, thank you. So I've asked, I so one of the questions I get a lot since I've been here is what's the criteria today? The town takes the thing, who makes the decision, what's involved. And so and we're in this place now where we are um, there are private ways that have been in, in existence for quite a while. So I thought it would be helpful. I did invite Bill to be here just to talk about initially when you're starting when, when the town's had in the past started a new um, subdivision, thank you. Uh, what what was what was the process of a town accepting a private way? And then also um, to talk a little bit about where we are now. I feel like we're my the end of this conversation. I would like to ask to be able to um, present or to work on a policy um, for accepting private ways and when we should go on the town warrant. So I just wanted to get, tell you that where I was going. But I think also the public who are watching it would be really helpful just to get Bill's initial, he's going to explain the subdivision, you know, when you're starting. And then Scott, if you have questions about Scott, about conditions, uh, older type of ways. So does that sound good? Does that sound helpful? All right. Bill? Okay. <clears throat> okay. At the outset. At the outset. 
I'm not quite sure why I have feedback. Not sure why I have feedback. Are you hearing feedback in your? Hearing room? feedback in your? Room? No. no. Okay. Uh, I, can, I can punch through it, I guess. Punch through it, I guess. At the outset, at the outset, vision is a private way because a public way can only be created by approval of town meeting. So um, we have subdivision regulations that say this is what the town wants to see in a in a way that we would like to have a certain number of inches of small gravel or large gravel, small gravel, a certain number of inches of asphalt, a certain number of inches of top coat, and certain other provisions in there. And <clears throat> those are all expressed in the subdivision regulations. Those regulations were developed in consultation with um, the highway department initially and DPW as of the, our latest version, which I think is 2014. And um, the idea is the, the average developer does not want to retain perpetual responsibility for maintaining a road. They want to lay it out, pave it, put up houses or sell lots, and move on to the next one. And uh, that's how roads come to town meeting to be accepted, that these are roads that have been built to town standards. And um, generally, if they are built to town standards and if DPW or in the prior version highway department said that they are still in good condition, um, generally we vote to accept them and accepting them adds them to our inventory of town roads um obviously many of these roads have some pretty expensive houses parked on them and uh, they're contributing to our tax base and probably entitled to have the town look after their roads uh, eventually if they're in good shape when first offered to the town um, there have been a few exceptions and a few glitches along the way, um, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds on those, but generally that's, that's the nature of the acceptance process. If you build a road to the town standards as expressed in the subdivision regulations, the town will consider accepting it at town meeting. Um, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Happy to take any questions. No, thank you. So here we are now, we have a list of, um, and I, I did give you a list of town, of, of town loans, some of the county loans, some of them are, um, not owned by the town. There are private ways that, that have been accepted. It shows where the load is when that took place. And then we do have other roads that have other private ways that have not been accepted. And so these are typically, um, you know, Bill was great in, in really helping understand like what happens, um, you know, 20, 30 years later um, after a contractor has walked away and it, now there's no one to, to um, at, at, you know, bring it up to standards and they and say, here, take it, let the have town take it. So um, I just give I wanted you to see that list. I, I want to thank Janice um, for make, sending that to me and um, putting that layout on there. Um, but I, I want I wanted to be able to show that we do have a one street a private way that did um, uh, uh, Scott did put together some uh, standards on what it needs to be met to accept it. And I think it was one owner took it upon himself to make some of those or. His soldier's house, yeah. So, but what happens here is this is a, a, new, a new director, a lot of people, three years, and he was a director before that. And so those standards aren't clear. And I think in order for the select board to, to be able to um, 
accept these or accept the request to put it at town meeting or to take it. I think there does need to be some standards and policies that are that it will keep certainly will help not set standards of substandard uh, expectations. Um, but it will also uh, be easier, I think, for people who live on private roads who want to accept it to be able to know exactly what your expectations are or what the town's expectations are. Is that something that should be like a minimum of understanding or should it be in the uh, No, I think it just could be a, a policy or a regulation. And I think the select board, uh, there are plenty of templates out there, like I did some homework. But, but what I would like to ask if you would um, give me the authorization to uh, reach out to some uh, staff members or uh, a planning board member to kind of look at those policies, review them, and, and I can bring them back to you for your review. Thank you, great. I have the yeah. combination of planning board and Yes, yes. I think that's no I give you, I move we give Carol an authorization to do that. Yeah. And Randy, you didn't know that he's probably going to sit on it. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you, Bill. Is it still, I, I, I was believe that there was policy planning board did not want the top coat put on a road until all the houses were built. Is that still uh, that, a standing? That, that is not a policy per se. Uh, that was a feedback from the developers that they didn't want to put a top coat on twice when they had excavators and cement trucks going up and down the road for foundations for the first houses. Uh, our policy is we want an as-built plan showing construction to subdivision regulation standards. And um, you know, that was, um, you know, the, the average developer would decide they're not going to ask to have it accepted until they put the top coat down, but they're not going to put it down twice. So they'll wait until the uh, heavy equipment is gone. Sure. I, I kind of disagree with that. I, I think it should be done, say, after one free slot boss, like, Go through a free slot bomb cycle, make sure you got good compaction and seal the road. The base is big stone. There's a lot of gapage. A lot of water seeps in between it. It's not it's not a top coat that's nice and tight and more sealing. And leaving the the base coat without the wear course on it does cause damage to the you know younger the base. Mm -hmm. like, it's not protected. It's, it's not meant to be open for a long period of time. So isn't the plan that Carol is going to work with the new people that are planning in order to, to draft a policy that will hash all those things out and no bring it back to us? That's what it sounded like. <laughs> but it certainly can amend <laughs> our regulations to, uh, to add that in. Uh, that does not require town meeting action. Yeah, I don't anticipate that we're going to have many new subdivision roads in town in the future. We're just trying to put to bed the ones that we have now that we let go way too long. So, so Jay made a motion. Did we actually need a motion or no? Or just, I mean, do you want a formal vote? I mean, if you do, I'll second Jay's motion. It was okay. <laughs> second. Motion by James by Molly. Any further discussion? Can I, I don't know if I can add or not. Sure. Uh, there's one thing too for a future meeting. I guess we really have to talk about uh, work on private roads as far as, far as snow removal, etc. Because there is MGL that states cannot do that. Yeah, so that would mean, definitely be a part of the policy. I've also included the the national law. Um, I don't know if it's the one that, yeah, I think it is in here. There's two or three mass general laws. There's also the, um, the one that we have. I, I, did, I did find an exemption for snow removal if the board voted. So you can't do snow removal. But right now, I don't think that the board ever voted to do that. So we that would kind of clean that up. Yeah. 
All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Sorry. All opposed? Excellent. Okay. Um, next thing on the right here. Oh, great. <laughs> the agenda is our meeting schedule. So I think that was something that Jane wanted to have on. And that we should talk about. I know we've been having meetings that are in access of the yeah. first. Um, they want to discuss um, potentially at another meeting or how we're feeling. Yeah. Well, I will speak to that at almost eight o'clock, and we still have a few items to go and executive session. And I know that coming up a special um, meeting, there are all these extra things we have to know and talk about. I think we should schedule a Another meeting so that we're not always going to it. Because I noticed at the last meeting, it was almost like we were unctuous. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <clears throat> we didn't have much discussion. And I think that if we're going to be serious better, we need to be able to discuss it without being exhausted. So, do we need to have a set? Extra meeting or an as needed extra meeting? I think as needed. I would, I would agree with that. Well, they're already as, as needed. We have them twice a month, and when we do budget, and when we do town meeting, we add meetings as we need them. Well, it's different than budget for town meeting because, well, I'm not doing a third meeting a month. I'll tell you that right now. So if you want to have it, I'm not being there. So I wonder, I wonder just in this spirit of not making it too it, maybe what we can do is say, right now we meet the first and the third, and we can pick. We could say block calendars for the first, second, and third, or the first, third, and fourth, whatever we want to do. And and Amy let us know, you know, if, if we need to have that meeting, and if we don't, then we can just take it off. I already have meetings every other Wednesday right now with the veterans, so my meetings are tied up every other Wednesday when they're not a select board meeting. So I think so. I mean, we do belong to other committees, you know. So I mean, yeah, this isn't the only one. And I don't know if I'm the only one feeling this, and maybe some some of you are, some of you aren't. Um, but sometimes I feel like when we're you know adding things to the agenda. When it's like supposed to be just like an update or a quick update, it ends up being like a discussion that can be very long. And sometimes I feel like our meetings are more like, you know, Hadley News Channel instead of Hadley Select Board doing things like, you know, we're here for licensing, we're here for, you know, certain things. And sometimes I feel like we kind of get bogged down and know that, you know, us being transparent is important, and I know that us making sure that the you know public is educated um, is wonderful. But I think sometimes it gets to be a bit too much in that sense. And so, after all that, what are you trying to say about <laughs> additional meetings? <laughs> I know I don't think I think no. I mean, you know, Jennifer and, and Carolyn work really hard to make our meetings, you know, make sense. Like today we had three different things on here that involved Linda, so she was not to come, you know, every meeting. Um, so I think a lot of thought is put into it. Um, I think sometimes maybe, I don't want to think you talk too much, but um, yeah, I'm not in favor of an additional meeting. I think we can kind of, uh, yeah. We do extra meetings for town meeting. We do the extra meeting to inform the public about town meeting. Mm -hmm. So that's already another, like a Thursday night that we do that. Um, and we do budget processing. So, I mean, and we have finance. Meetings. I mean, we do have extra meetings when they're needed. I don't think that we need to schedule, per se, a third meeting every month. But there what are, I heard Jane say was she's in favor of having but she's proposing that we acknowledge that we may need to have a third meeting if some, it, some it, months. 
if it's for budget or for town meeting. Well, I mean, I'll tell you right now. I mean, so it's September 20th. Yeah, we've just seen the special town meeting warrant for the very first time. Yeah, right. And we're going to special town meeting in how many weeks? Five. Yeah. And so, and maybe it's like, okay. I mean, it's not that big a deal, but I, I'd like to have a placeholder. I think we should be yeah. at Adam meeting now. Mm -hmm. Because there may be things, and if, again, they can cancel it. But, uh, but I also agree. I've had a couple of people who you know watch or you know watch the replays afterwards or whatever make the comment that Jane did more of sympathy. Uh, it wasn't a criticism, but it was like, wow, I was watching a meeting the other night. Like at least I could go in the kitchen and grab a snack or whatever. You guys all looked exhausted. <laughs> And it's true, you're not. But that was the night that we had two executive sessions, one at the beginning and one at the end. That's very highly unusual that that has happened. In but all the years that I've been doing this, we have not had that many three and a half hour meetings. My goodness, you couldn't stand it when I was chair because we had three meetings a month. Yeah. And, and because we had. But we did always have three meetings. Yeah, we canceled them when we had three. So, 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 so Jennifer and Carolyn. And Amy make up this agenda, and they have a good sense of that's going to be a long meeting or that's not going to be a long meeting. And when they see that coming, they should say, okay, the meeting on the third Thursday is just way too long. We're going to schedule one for the fourth Thursday also, or Wednesday also. And I also, I mean, I don't think we expected the, the levy engineering assessment update to be an hour. And have fun at it. Uh, so I think that might have just done something today. That was now, I remember last year that sometimes when there was executive sessions, they wouldn't necessarily be tied to the meeting date. And I know that sometimes I wasn't able to because I was in Connecticut, but now I'm in a situation where if there was a that I'm in a situation now where um, if you guys wanted to do executive session, not necessarily right after our meetings, on a different day, on a different time, during the day. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I think that. I was the, I was the problem. With that, right. so it has something for an schedules. Yeah, and then that way we would be not today. Which right. Sorry, but we would have done something. No, I think that makes good sense if we do executive not time meeting, and that it does schedule another meeting, but it's a very specific meeting. Yeah, is, is everyone okay with that? Yeah, that's right. Okay. We need to go around that. And the other thing, Amy, I would say to your point. Is it's perfectly okay as the chair for you to say, can we take a time out? I feel like this discussion is going too long. And then we can say, no, I want to keep talking. <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah, it's perfectly good your purview as chair to do that. But I want to be in. Nice chair. I think selected on who gets pumps. Just like what I asked Iris, Amy, and we got to be, are you afraid to say no? <laughs> I don't know. I just God, no, I'm not afraid to say that. Well, we know. <laughs> Tell us. Okay. We're, you know, we're not in favor of adding an additional meeting every month. We will probably have a placeholder for an additional meeting before uh, the special town meeting. And obviously, we have our public form before the town meeting. And then uh, executive sessions. So they have to be posted. Executive sessions, but doing them, you know, not with the Wednesday meetings. So what do we come yeah. And, and, and if you see a really long meeting coming. Yeah. And also we can, you know, if there's something that's going longer than we anticipate, um, things that aren't uh, needing to be done, we can always push from the meeting to the next meeting. And if you're on vacation, you don't need to go into our meetings. If you really want to be on vacation, you can be on vacation and not give a meeting. It's okay. okay to do that. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I skipped a meeting yet in my three years. Okay. Anyway. anyway we'll yeah. um, yeah. our, the town website. I'm going to share in the night of taking things up at another meeting. This is going to be a long-term process, and I would be happy to discuss it on October 4th. 
or about like even after town meeting. This is not something that I'm looking for in the next four weeks. Okay. Maybe think four months. So let's table this for a future meeting. Thank you. Excellent. Um, do we need to vote on moving it? Good note. Goodbye. Great. Any other items not anticipated 48 hours in advance? Nope. Excellent. Um, town administrator. It's only going to take me half hour. <laughs> so I will. So actually, we thank Molly for this because her guidance in giving for doing the um, the reports that the the town administrator report and having those projects listed and have be able to update and then add to it. If you look at it, and I, I will, I'll give you the ability to read it in other times. Just one other thing that I want to. You'll look at the town administrator report and in red is anything new or updated. So that's on there for you to read your leisure it's been, and it's a public documents that they can see that as well. I do want to highlight that um, we we have to move forward with our cable renewal license. Um, Alex has done a good job um, with the getting the input from the public, um, but we do. Our town council does not um, provide council for charter for our cable renewals. So I got a great recommendation from town council and we are working with an attorney in, in the Boston area. This was Boston area, great guy that all he and his partner do is cable renewal. And I learned a lot about it today. It's way more intense than we ever anticipated we really need to do that. So that's going to be moving along. That's supposed to uh, be uh, over with. The, the, re the renewal is due in uh, March, so it's quick, but we have done some, Alex has done some of it, so we'll be at a really fast pace, but with this, the level of uh, experience that this term has, I think we'll be fine. But you will be a part of that, probably in executive session, I'll make sure it's during the day, <laughs> we'll make sure that that's reasonable. Um, but I did put the schedule in for the RFQ, uh, for the Russell School when you say the date line for that, for that feasibility study. So we take a look at that. We do have the second walk for tomorrow. There's 38. Yeah. 38, uh, not 38 people showing up to walk rooms, but 38 requests for. Excuse me? Excuse me? When is submission due? It's on that date in the order. Well, October 12th. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, you have a copy of the DPW brochure. I didn't have that. I um, didn't pick this up for today. So you, yours might be a little bit outdated. That's that. Please look through the rest. Um, just know that tomorrow there is the agent's bench friendly presentation here um, that not only myself will be speaking at, but also Amy fighting on behalf of financial abuse for elders. So that will take place here at 530. And it's the usual people and some great job with that. So you feel free to look to the rest of the time. You okay with that? Okay. No? Okay. Good job. Thanks. Um, any items for future discussion? Yeah, just uh, just in all likelihood committee with me tomorrow night. But we're likely going to be asking for an audience with the select board and also the planning board. Again, just in the spirit of, you know, whatever we're talking about, making sure everybody's comfortable with that and aware of that. Um, so, maybe I'll coordinate with you. Okay. And I think it might not be a bad idea to talk about the uh, public comment period and any time for that. Not tonight. No, that's so good, future, yeah. future items. Yeah. That. Okay. Anything else? I don't know. Um, any liaison reports? Oh, okay. Announcements? Yeah. We'll send an email off. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Sending condolences from the select board to Judith Carson Haskell family, um, to the teacher for her PhD in biology over in Northampton, originated here at Hadley. So condolences to her and to her two children. Also, the passing of John Quinlan, he was the brother of Tom Quinlan Sr. Uh, so condolences to him. 
to his uh, other family members, Tom Marco and Inspector Alto, so the buildings to that family. Um, any other announcements? Okay. So then we are going to. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Select Board will hold in executive session for the following purposes. Per MGL Chapter 30A21A2, A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non union personnel, the, D the DPW director. Um, to and to discuss strategy with respect to a pending litigation, uh, namely written here. But here, we are in open, so and where an open meeting that may have detrimental effect on litigating positions. Besides the meeting. Second. Not to not, reconvene. Yeah, session. not to reconvene. Uh, not to reconvene. So, as chair of the Public Stuff Board, I said that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive sessions. And I state that discussing the matter of opening session will have a So, we need a vote call vote. I'm sorry, who was the second? Okay. John. Keegan? Yes. Chandler? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Nedison? Yes. And Isaacs? Yes. 